We've got Fipo. Someone might even know him as Philip Henke. Uh, okay. <laughs> did I say it right? Yes, you did. He comes to us from a period, and others might know him by the guy that has the most number of bugs in the Chromium, whatever, about WebRTC. Mm -hmm. I know him as the guy that if you have any real issue of the behavior of WebRTC, he's the guy to ask. You ask, you get immediately a URL of a bug in Chrome that is the responsibility and in which versions it was published, what happens today, and when it's going to be fixed. And today is going to talk about Duo. One of the things that he loves doing is to tinker with stuff, and he tinkers usually with other applications that use WebRTC. So go yeah. for it. So today I'm going to talk about Duo. Thanks, Sai, for the intro, so I can skip that. So last year, we did a WebRTC hack series. Chad asked me after reverse engineering Hangouts to do some more stuff on WebRTC hacks, and we got Google to sponsor a basically a survey of the mobile application space. We did stuff on WhatsApp, on FaceTime, Facebook Messenger. And why did Google do that? We didn't find out that last year, but at Google I.O. we saw them launching Duo. And it's built by the team behind WebRTC, they said, and they said, we know this technology like no one else. And yep, challenge accepted. <laughs> so I started reverse engineering that, but first, why would you do that? So one of the things is you want to look at what your competitor does. I'm not implying I'm competing with Google here. And you want to also to look at how your own app behaves. And like, what protocols do they use for signaling? What codecs do they use? Do they use H.264, VP8, VP9? What bandwidth settings do they use, which you will see in appear in a lot. We do tinker with that. What signaling protocols are used? What, how does the connection establishment work? We saw that with WhatsApp. And do they have any exciting features that you can, um, let's say, borrow? <laughs> so in terms of tools, I prefer just to sniff the traffic on the network. It's easy on the legal side. You don't have to reverse engineer the binary, which is a little more tricky usually. And I mainly use TCP dump and Wireshark. TCP dump for capturing stuff, and then Wireshark for analyzing it. Even though I end up writing a lot of actual code that processes the packets and then displays them in certain ways. We'll see that. So I also like this Wi-Fi pineapple router. It's very convenient because it's a Wi-Fi hacking device. And it's very convenient for mobile development because you can just SSH into it, do a TCP dump, and get the same behavior you get on Wireshark, the same functionality on this device. And it allows you to capture from your mobile device. So Duo has some interesting features. First thing is the connection setup. Google was very interested in that last year. The other is Knock Knock, which basically shows the caller's video before you accept. And another big thing they are proud of is the switch between 4G and Wi-Fi. So in terms of connection setup, we found when looking at WhatsApp that they are going for a relay server first. And basically, they start doing that call, establishing a connection to the relay server. And then once they get that, and that is most likely going to work, they try to move to peer-to-peer. -peer. And that gives you a slightly faster call setup since you have less connections to check. And if you use ICE, there's a slight cost of doing more connections, checking more connections. And yep, we found that Duo uses turn first. So the orange line you see here is on port 19305. They're running the turn servers on the same port as they do for their AppRTC demo. And what you can see is also that it seems to be used exclusively during knock-knock, which might be a privacy thing, like you don't want to expose the other IP address. And once the knock-knock phase is over, which took like seven seconds in that graph, you can see the pink line. And you can see that the other side is answering. It is the audio you can see at the bottom. It's a bit late. I don't know why yet, but maybe I'll find out. And it uses DTLS. It uses ECDSA P265 to generate those certificates, which is much faster than the old 
RSA certificates on mobile devices, and that was an optimization that started in 2014. You can see that the, if you look at the Wireshark stuff, you can see that it's 91 bytes certificates hidden inside turn channel data, which makes it very hard to find. And initially, I didn't see it. So I thought, oh, it's SDES, but it wasn't. So knock, knock. It is not a really new idea. You see who's calling, and then you can decide whether you want to accept. And it has probably been tried many times in the past, but it isn't common. So why didn't it work out? And I think it requires a very high video quality instantly, in the first few seconds. Because if you see a blob of pixels, then you're not going to accept the call. So what Google did is they implemented a new way to estimate the bandwidth. And that's called Sandside BWE. And you can see it in the RTP packets, because they have a specific RTP header extension with an ID 5. And I could observe them. So the orange line there shows the ramp up to 1 megabit per second. And I think Nicholas is going to talk about that later. And there it takes 7 seconds, which is a bit bad, probably. I'm going to touch that later. But you see the answer is video. The purple line goes up very fast in less than a second. And I blame those results on the capture setup I had. So one thing I noticed is that after knock knock, one part of the ICE username fragment changes. That is similar to an ICE restart, but it's not a full ICE restart. And we'll talk more about that now, because the seamless handoff they have it is a quite a restless feature. Basically, you think the situation is you walk out of the door, you walk out of the range of your Wi-Fi, and then just switches from Wi-Fi network to mobile network. And it works really great. I found it to switch in less than two seconds. So in terms of usability, it's great. I even saw it sometimes happening between two clients on the same Wi-Fi, which then fall back to the mobile network, which probably is a bug. So how do you capture that? How do you capture stuff from the mobile network to observe this behavior? So I work for a telco. So Appearing is part of Telenor. So I just thought, OK, maybe I can do my pineapple stuff on the one end and a GSM gateway support node box on the other end. It's a little hard to get access to those boxes unless you're a telco. Even then, it's not easy. And it turns out that it is very hard to sync those captures between those two capture files you got from that. Fortunately, there's an easier way. Basically, you capture re the receiving end of the call. So the other side is initially connected to 4G and Wi-Fi. And then at some point, you just plug the, unplug the Wi-Fi router. And what do we see when we do that? We see that it, on the left side there is the orange line that is the turn first part before knock knock is accepted. Then we can see that the pink line where peer to peer kicks in, it's on a different connection. And then at 16.15, I unplug the router. You see the pink line ends, and there's this orange part in the middle, which kicks in after that. It's on the same connection that was used previously with the turn server, but it's a different peer. You can see that if you look very closely in the capture packets. It's not very nice because you need to go through thousands of packets. And then after plugging the router back, the traffic switches back to the Wi-Fi network. Because in some countries, it's costing you money to use the mobile data. And we can also see during this switching phase, when the, there's a slight glitch when turning the Wi-Fi off, that forward error correction is kicking in. So you can see that in those red and green lines at that point, And that turned out to be important later. And it's the same connection as we've used previously. It's turned due to the capture setup I had. And you can see the different peers in the turn channel binding and send data indications. And what you, we can see here is the orange line continues even though the pink line is transferring all the data. And most important, it's not an ice restart. The username fragment combination stays the same, which makes it by definition not an ice restart. So 
ICE results are basically the standard way of dealing with a connection failure in ICE. You send, gather new candidates, send them via the signaling channel. Problem is, if you walk out of the door, your signaling channel may have just died as well. And what Duo does, it avoids this. It doesn't do an ICE restart. It keeps this other connection open, and then it can seamlessly switch over to that connection. That has the advantage that it works when the signaling channel is down. Even though the signaling channel is probably quick, so they might reestablish at that point. It's very hard to determine, and I don't think they're going to talk about that anytime soon. So another thing to commonly check here is what audio codec is used. Like We know Google still likes the ISAC codec a lot. It's still in Chrome, but in the packets, in the dump, I just found payload type 111, which is the standard Opus payload type. No surprise here. I mean, Opus has a great quality. The more interesting question, and I'm looking at you, Zahi, is what is the video codec used? Is it H.264? Is it VP8? Is it VP9? So I searched for the standard payload types, which are 100 for VP8, 101 for VP9, and 107 for H.264, and I didn't find anything. And that is why I default the WebRTC library encodes the data or sends them, prefers to send them on the network using the redundant data, which is payload type 116. However, there were retransmissions during that glitch phase, and it took me quite a while to find those. And what I saw was a number of packets with a RTP payload type 99, which in Chrome is a common retransmission payload type for the payload type 107, which, if you paid attention on the previous slide, turns out to be H.264. And I think it's because I captured iOS iOS sessions mainly. And of course, it's, on iOS, it's a battery life question. And you want to conserve battery life. You want to use hardware acceleration. So H.264 is a natural choice there. It seems that the controlling the bit rate of the hardware encoder is a bit tricky. We've seen a number of bug fixes there recently. And the quality I got from Duo was less than I expected. So more improvements. Overall, I think Duo solved quite a number of hard engineering problems. And I've seen the problems I've known in the last two, three years that they have been working on it. And it really took them that long, probably. So to do this fast call setup, they do this turn first stuff, which landed in Chrome in January, I think. They do ECA DSA certificates, WebRTC switched completely to that. It's the default in Chrome since Chrome 52. This walk out of the door problem is solved by keeping a fallback connection open. And the hardware encoding to maximize battery life using H.264 for iOS, iOS. That is something that has been worked on last year, mostly. And one of the big problems that still remains is this initial video quality thing. And you really want this fast ramp up due to send side bandwidth estimation, and I think it is very promising what is going to happen here. And it's going to be default in Chrome 55, which is going to be rolling out in a couple of weeks. So basically, that makes Duo a real benchmark against which you can test your application in terms of quality and features. And I'll let, just let that stand. So good work, Justin. <laughs> Hope you're not unhappy. Thank <laughs> you.